Hey, welcome to another video. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to solve for missing sides and missing angles in a right triangle. We're going to use trigonometry a lot because sometimes Pythagorean theorem and interior angle sum just simply won't solve for everything we need. But it's an important point I have it written down. When we're doing this, when we're using trigonometry to solve a right triangle, like the missing sides and angles, one thing, there's a few things that, that we really try to do every time. Number one, try not to make it harder than it is. Use the easy stuff first. So what, what that means is that if we're gonna be using trigonometry at some point, there's no reason why we can't use Pythagorean theorem and interior angle sum if it solves some of these parts for us. There's a number of reasons why we do that as we get on through, um, I'll be explaining that. So what we're learning today is really just how to solve for missing sides and angles. We'll be using trigonometry, but don't forget this stuff is quite important and oftentimes a lot easier. Um, than using the trigonometry. Or maybe if it's not easier, it at least gives us an exact answer rather than the approximations we normally get with trig. So we're gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna lead you through the process of how I pretty much always uh, solve a right triangle, how I label the sides, how I identify what's going on. We're only gonna do four examples. Um, I'm gonna work my way through exactly what I would expect. Uh, you'd understand. So let's take a look. The first thing about working with right triangle trigonometry is making sure you actually have a right triangle because the sine, cosine, and tangent will not work the way that we've set it up with the so toa or sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. It won't work without that being a right triangle. So if we have a right triangle, that's the number one thing we wanna look for, that this is gonna work just fine. The second thing I do on a right triangle is I always label the hypotenuse first before I do anything else. I don't care whether it's Pythagorean theorem or whether I'm using trigonometry, I'm labeling the hypotenuse. So I'm thinking if that's the 90 degree angle, the hypotenuse is opposite of that. So I'm thinking straight line right through my triangle, it's gonna hit my hypotenuse. I label that. After that, I might start looking to see if I can find out anything else about this triangle before using trigonometry. Now, I said I'm going to explain to you why you might want to do that instead of just jumping right into the trig. It's because when you use trigonometry, you oftentimes will give an approximation. We do not want to use those approximations in finding more measurements unless we absolutely have to. Why? Because when you take an approximation, you're rounding a number. If you use that rounded number in other functions, you're gonna round it again. You're compounding error. So you have a little bit of error because you round it, then you use it again, and then you round again. Well, that's gonna compound that. There's really only one operation that we'll be using that does not compound error, and it's subtraction. So I'll, I'll talk about when we get to finding angles more uh, about how subtraction does not compound our error in this case. Uh, but just, just keep this in mind. Pythagorean theorem will give you an exact answer every time in terms of a square root. And interior angle sum will give you an exact answer every time in terms of, in terms of degrees of an angle. Trigonometry sometimes doesn't do that. So it, it's really in our benefit to figure out everything we can, the easy stuff or use interior angle sum and Pythagorean theorem before you start to trig. So when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing, yeah, there's a four, there's a B, I can't really find my hypotenuse. I'm not even asking for that anyway, but Pythagorean theorem really isn't gonna be useful for us because I only know one side. However, interior angle sum is very useful for us. If I know the angles of a triangle, any triangle, add up to 180, and I also know that this is a right triangle, 90 of that 180 is taken up. That's only 90 degrees left between the two angles that I have. What that means, we talked about this word a while back, um, last video actually, is that these two angles are complementary. That means adds up to 90. So if you know one of them, you automatically know the other. So it's always okay to take 90 degrees minus one angle and you get the other angle in a right triangle. So I know for sure that A is gonna be 80 degrees because A and 10 degrees have to add to 90. Now, did we need trigonometry to do that? No, and it's nice to have that, that angle. Now we're gonna go ahead and try to figure out what our missing side is. So there's something that I often do, I'll teach students this, is kind of a process of elimination of finding out what trig function you need. So I've identified a right triangle, I've put my hypotenuse, I've figured out uh, my angle by interior angle sum of a triangle, and now I'm gonna be looking at this triangle as 
what else can I label? Here's what I mean by that. When you're dealing with a right triangle and about to use trigonometry, it's super useful to label your hypotenuse. But then what I want to do, I want to look at what angle is given or what angle I want to use if both of them are given and then relate the sides to that angle. So right triangle, yes. Hypotenuse, I've labeled it. I'm going to mark down what I think is the angle that would be easiest to use. I know both 10 degrees and 80 degrees. I'm really more comfortable using this angle. I don't know why, it just seems easier to find the opposite side and the hypotenuse, uh, or sorry, opposite and adjacent sides from that. So I'm going to be thinking about this angle. So after you've labeled a hypotenuse, after you've identified the angle you want to find or want to use, after that, then we're going to label our sides. I'm going to think straight through my triangle here is going to give me the opposite side to the angle I want to use. I'm going to label that opposite. The only side left is the adjacent side. What this does for us, it makes it really easy to choose a trig function um, because what we're going to do, what trig functions always do, they relate an angle to two sides. Well, what trig function relates the angle that I've marked that I want to use with the two sides that I one know and other don't? Well, that would be opposite over adjacent. We can find a trig function that relates opposite and adjacent to an angle. It's going to be tangent. There is another way to look at this. Look at the one side that you don't know and you don't care about. Well, that's the hypotenuse. I'm not asked to find it and it's not given, so I can't really use it. So. If you have eliminated the hypotenuse from your useful sides, eliminate the hypotenuse on your trig functions and it will leave you with the one you have remaining. It's kind of a process of elimination. So sometimes I'll have students just write out Sokatoa, because that's sine, cosine, and tangent, what we actually use to solve for angles and sides and right triangles most of the time. And I'll say, what side don't you really care about? I don't care about hypotenuse. Okay, I'm not given it, I'm not asked for it. That uses hypotenuse, that uses hypotenuse. What's the only one left? Tangent. We have to use tangent here to find that side if we're going to be looking at that angle. So we write it out. Now that we know that that's 80 degrees, we don't have to use angle A, we know it's 80. Can you see how it's useful to know both angles, if at all possible? If you're given one, you, you do know the other. It, it's pretty useful to know because it, it lets you have more options. That also says something. There's more than one way to do this. So could you have identified this angle and then labeled this as opposite and this is adjacent to that angle? Yes, absolutely. As long as you're using a, a trig function appropriately, you really can't go wrong. Okay, so I know, I know it's a right triangle. I label hypotenuse. I've identified an angle that I want to use opposite adjacent from there. I've eliminated the possibility of sine and cosine. I'm dealing with tangent. Tangent relates an angle to the opposite over adjacent sides. In this case, tangent of 80 degrees is 4 over B. Now, how in the world would you solve for B? This is really a two-step process. You see, if we if we have a fraction with variables on it, we got to get rid of that denominator, even if it's itself is a is a variable. How we do that is multiplying both sides by our denominator. So we're going to multiply both sides by b. On the right hand side, yeah, these cancel and you get four. But on the left hand side, we get b times tangent of eighty degrees. We're really close to done. We, we just have to divide. And if we do that, tangent of 80 degrees divided by tangent of 80 degrees is 1. It leaves us with b. And we get b equals 4 over tangent 80 degrees. Listen, this is what is called an exact answer. This has all the information about that side. This is exactly how long that side is in terms of whatever units you had. Um, but it's not very useful. You see, we can't probably can't cut a piece of lumber at 4 divided by tangent of 80 degrees because we don't really know, we don't practice using that in, in real life. Um, so oftentimes you'll see this approximated. So in doing that, you take your calculator, plug it in just like it looks. 4 divided by tangent of 80 degrees, we get about 0.71. Point 
0.71 units. If that had been inches, we'd put inches, feet, feet, and so on. There, there's something that I just said though. This is about 0.71. Here's what I don't want you to do. This is something we really gotta avoid. If this is 0.71 and that's been approximated, don't use approximations in future math if you can avoid it at all, almost at all costs. There's times when we have to, but if you can avoid it, do not use approximations to figure out other measurements. So how in the world would you figure out C if I asked you to? Well, what we could do is use trigonometry, but just look at either a different angle or a different trigonometric relationship to do it. If we wanted to continue, if I wanted to find out what the hypotenuse was, the last thing I'd want to do is Pythagorean theorem right now. Why? Well, because while that's four, this isn't exactly 0.71, is it? It's like 0 0.705 something, something, something forever. If I use this, I've already rounded. Then I'm going to put this in a, a square. So I'm going, to, I'm going to square 0 0.71. 0 0.71 squared is going to make that error worse. Then I'm going to add it to four squared and take a square root of it. Well, when I take the square root, it's going to make the error worse yet. And then I'm going to round it again. And it's really the second rounding that causes the compounding of the error. I will have rounded, used it, and rounded again. It's going to be more off than I want it to be. I don't want to have that much error in it. So if you can avoid it, don't use your rounded numbers. So, so let's think, is there a different way we could go to find out C? Well, let's see. If I'm not really concerned about finding the adjacent and I can't use it, does that eliminate some other trig functions? I mean, I already have the hypotenuse. I already knew what that was. I already have this angle that I'm comfortable using, so I'm gonna mark that again. This is still the opposite side. This is the adjacent side. This is the hypotenuse side for sure. But if I can't use the adjacent side anymore, because it's already been rounded, if I can't use it, that eliminates the possibility of cosine and tangent. The only thing that's left open to us to solve for our hypotenuse is sine. And that's really nice. That's really the way we want to go through it is eliminate what you can't use and that will leave you with what you can. Some people just look at it and go, hey, there's my angle. I have opposite. I need hypotenuse. Sine would relate the angle I know or want to use to the opposite and hypotenuse sides. That's fine too, either way you want to go. We run into a really similar situation. So we're going to multiply both sides by C to remove the fraction and then divide both sides by sine 80 degrees to solve for C. And we get that C is exactly 4 divided by sine 80 degrees, but approximately 4.06. Question, is it making sense why this number is slightly bigger than this number? I want you to think about sine. Remember that sine always returns values between negative 1 and 1. There's nothing bigger than 1. So if I'm going to divide 4 by a number smaller than one, it should give me a larger number. That's why division here gives you a larger number, not a smaller number. Also, let's make sure this makes sense. Remember that the hypotenuse has to be the longest side. 4.06, 4, and 0.71. Okay, good. Hey, that's a great way to check our work. Also, smaller angles generally open to smaller sides. 10 degrees opens to opposite, 0.71. 80 degrees opens to 4. That makes sense. Our larger angles are opening to larger sides, and our smaller angles are opening to smaller sides. The last thing is that, I'm just going to reiterate it one more time. If you had done Pythagorean theorem with 0.71 and 4, you'd be close to this number, but this would be more accurate because you didn't have to round a rounded number. I hope it makes sense. I hope you're seeing the, the process of going through it, labeling your hypotenuse, finding your angle, labeling your sides, and then kind of determining which trig function lets you do what you need to do. Don't use rounded numbers in other math unless you have to. The only time we really do that is when we're subtracting angles. I'm going to get to that in a couple examples. Um, for right now, let's go ahead and do another one. Let's go ahead and give this one a try. So we have a triangle. It's a right triangle. That means Pythagorean theorem and trigonometry are going to work for it. That's the first thing I check is if I'm, if what I have 
is going to work with what I want to use. So that's a right triangle. It works with Pythagorean theorem. It works with trigonometry. That's a good thing. Next, I'm trying to identify what in the world I'm trying to find and ultimately going to be labeling my hypotenuse. So I take a look and say, that's a right triangle. Before I do anything else, I label hypotenuse. Now that we've labeled the hypotenuse, one of the first things I always do is see if some of the, maybe it's not easier, but the things that will give you the exact answers will work on this. What do I mean by that? Trigonometry oftentimes gives you approximations back. You're using your calculator and you round it. Pythagorean theorem doesn't do that. Interior angle sum doesn't do that. It gives you a square root for Pythagorean theorem. It can give you exact angles for interior angle sum. And so that would be preferable than rounding something. So I'm always looking, does Pythagorean theorem or interior angle sum help me find what I need? If I have to find two angles and the hypotenuse in this case, I'm probably seeing that these guys work for, for me first. I see two sides, their, their legs, that's great. I see a hypotenuse that I'm gonna have to find. Pythagorean theorem works great. This is preferable to using trigonometry. Also, I don't have any angles, so I kind of have to do something. Now, now, what's the other thought process? Couldn't you find an angle first and then use this angle to find the hypotenuse? You can, but remember, when you find one of these angles, it is going to be rounded for you to be able to use it later. And so if you use a rounded angle here, this is not going to be exact. Pythagorean theorem returns something exact for you. That's, pre that's preferable, that's nicer. And so we're gonna do that. So use the things that aren't trigonometry to figure out some of these, these measurements before you use trig, if you can. So I'm thinking, all right, if this is the hypotenuse, this is a leg, and this is leg. This is why I label hypotenuse first every time. So off to the side, I'm gonna write out my Pythagorean theorem. I always do it the same, I always write out parentheses, parentheses, square everything and add these together. Then in my mind, I really know what happens. I know the hypotenuse is by itself. It's always alone being squared. That's just C in this case. I know my legs are always together and that'll really help you to fill out Pythagorean theorem. Always fill this out with hypotenuse on one side, legs on the other side, everything's being squared added together. So leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. If we solve that, this is nine plus 25. That's 34, so C squared equals 34. If we take a square root, you actually do not need a plus and minus because we're not dealing with um, like an XY coordinate system where we could have a negative radius or something. These are actual measurements. So this is just the square root of 34. Now, that is exactly what this hypotenuse is. This is not an approximation. I know for sure that's square root 34. What I don't want to do, I don't want to round that to, well, let's see, something just under six, five point something. I don't want to round that and use that in later math. Remember, do not use rounded numbers in future math if you can avoid it. I'm going to leave this as exactly square root 34. Now, could I do an approximation? Yeah, sure. And if you wanted to cut this to a measurement or something, you might do that. But to use it in math, it should be exact. So I've looked at it. Uh, man, right triangle looks good. Label hypotenuse. If I can do anything else besides trig, I do it now. So I can't find any angles. I don't know one of them. Um, I can find the hypotenuse by Pythagorean theorem. We're looking pretty good. Now, the benefit of understanding that that's an exact answer is that you can use this in trigonometry. This is this is what it is. It's not round. It's not an approximation. You can use that. That's why we do things like Pythagorean theorem and interior angle sum first. It gives us exactness, which you can then utilize. Trigonometry doesn't do that. Um, if we round it, it is rounded and you should not use it. So now we got to find some angles. Um, how we do this depends on which angle you want to find first. It doesn't really matter. My personal preference, I like finding angles at the bottom of the triangle because it, it works better in my head. So I've already labeled hypotenuse, but once I've identified an angle that I'm given or an angle I want to use or find, which I have, I want to find that angle, then I go on and I label the rest of my triangle. And now I'm going to go ahead and look straight across that triangle. This is the opposite side. And this is now the adjacent side. It has to be because you've already labeled hypotenuse. That's why we do it first. So now that we've done that, I'm thinking through what trig function do I want to use or that I can use to relate the angle I want to find 
to two of the sides that I, I know. Now, I know all three sides, so, so look, this gives you options. You can do this a number of ways. Any way is right, as long as you're using a correct trig function that relates two sides that you know. Um, one thing we don't, remember, I'm gonna say this a lot, one thing we don't wanna do, do not round that and then use that. You cannot do that. I guess you can, but don't do that. So normally what I would do is look for two sides that are kind of easier. I probably don't wanna use a square root of 34, even though it doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm looking at angle A and I'm thinking, hey, I know opposite over adjacent. I know opposite over hypotenuse. I know adjacent over hypotenuse. I know sine, cosine, and tangent of all these, but tangent uses what I would consider simple numbers. So I'm thinking with Sokotoa, If I know all three of them, I can use any of those trig functions, but if I don't want to use the hypotenuse, then I probably don't want to use sine or cosine. I'm going to use tangent. And because tangent of angle A relates an angle to the opposite and adjacent side, we get tangent of angle A equals 5 over 3. Now, how in the world do you solve for an angle like that? Everything in math that you want to solve for requires a type of inverse. For instance, uh, if you want to solve something with addition, you need its inverse, you need subtraction. If you want to solve something with multiplication, you need its inverse, you need division. If you want to solve something with tangent, you need its inverse. See, multiplication, division, addition, addition, subtraction are not inverses for this. This tangent says I'm a function that relates A, this angle, to two sides. If you want to undo tangent, you need the thing that undoes tangent, and we call that tangent inverse. The second part of it is, whatever you do to an equation, you're pretty much good to go as long as you do it to both sides. So when we see tangent of angle A equals 5 thirds, I need the thing that undoes tangent. We call that tangent inverse. So if we do this to both sides, and say, I'm going to take tangent inverse of both sides of this equation. Then here's what this here's what this basically says in plain English: thing that undoes tangent of tangent. Now, what's going to happen? Tangent. The thing that undoes tangent is going to undo tangent. You're just going to be left with a. Much like multiplication cancels division, much like addition cancels subtraction, tangent inverse cancels tangent. This is going to go away. You wouldn't want to use like sine inverse for tangent. Match the appropriate function. So I'm going to undo tangent with tangent inverse. It's inverse. It's undoing thing. I just have to do it on both sides because that's how equations work. So I'm left with just a. On the right hand side, we have tangent inverse of 5 thirds. Now that looks a little funny, but this is exactly what that angle is. This would be called an exact answer. Tangent inverse gives you out an angle. If tangent of an angle gives you out sides, tangent inverse of sides gives you out an angle. Specifically that angle, the one that you mark, the one that you set up for this, the angle that you are referencing. So that's exact. That's exactly what it is, but it's not as usual, is it? Because we can't, we don't really know what that measurement is off the top of our heads. So we can take our calculator press tangent inverse. It's usually right above the tangent. You'll need a shift or a second button and press five thirds. And we're going to find out the degree measurement for this if your calculator is in degrees, which I'm going to use, or the radian measurement for this if your calculator is in radians. Usually with right triangle trigonometry, we're more about degrees. Um, so I'm going to keep this in degrees. Now we get that angle A is about 59.0 degrees. A couple things about this is kind of important that a lot of people just skip. If you're going to round something, even if you round it and says, oh, you're going to have zero, don't put just 59. That 59.0 tells people that you've rounded. It says, oh yes, I've rounded to one more decimal place than the information I'm given. That's usually how the rounding rule works. Um, but I've, I've rounded this and this 59.0 would tell people that. So it's not exactly 59 degrees, and people would know that by how you're writing that. Secondly, if this is about 59 degrees, we now know this angle. Could you figure out this angle, angle B? And the answer is yes. This is the one time that you can use approximated values to figure out something else. Here's why. Subtraction in this case does not compound your error. If you were to do this another way, how much you do it? 
Well, you might do it tangent of angle B equals opposite 3 over 5. But what you're going to get is an approximation that when you subtract from 90 is exactly the same as this one. So if you're only caring about the approximations, you can easily subtract this from 90, this from 90 degrees and get that angle. And we would get that B is about 31 degrees. Hey, they're complementary. They add up to, to 90 degrees. Um, remember, you don't really want to do that with any, any of this other stuff, Pythagorean theorem or any of the other trig functions. The only time it really doesn't hurt us all that much is with interior angle sum. Now, let's say you needed the exact answer and 31 degrees wasn't good enough. And they said, you have to know exactly what it is just like that. Well, then you'd have to go through the trigonometry. So you'd have to adjust the angle you're looking for. What that means is that the side you've marked as adjacent is no longer adjacent. If you change angles, you change or you swap those sides. So I really don't want to look at angle A if I'm trying to find angle B by itself. Now your hypotenuse wouldn't change, but opposite would now be 3. And adjacent would now be 5. So we could set up tangent again. Tangent of angle B equals opposite over adjacent. If we take tan inverse, the inverse or the thing that undoes tangent on both sides, we're going to end up with tangent inverse of 3 fifths. Tangent inverse of 3 fifths is about 31.0 degrees. This is the exact angle that that is, for sure. But when you approximate it to use it, you would end up getting, which is why it's okay to subtract them, you would end up getting exactly what you get when you subtract 90 minus that approximation. It does work every time. That what you get here and what you get here, if you round to the same digit, is going to add to 90 degrees which means you can use it for approximations. You can't use it for exactness though, can you? Like this, this does not tell you the exact answer. If you subtract, um, you'd have to do other trigonometry for that. So I hope that, that that's made sense. I hope you're seeing the process of going through it. Label the hypotenuse, use the stuff before trigonometry that you can. And then with trig, we're identifying an angle that we have, that we want to use, or that we want to find. After that, labeling opposite and adjacent and using an appropriate trig function. We're going to come back, we're going to do one more, and then we're going to give you a, a real life example. Okay, last one before our application type problem. We want to solve this right triangle. What solving a right triangle means is just finding all the missing sides and angles. So let's, let's look at this. It is a right triangle, and let's label what we want to label first. Mostly on this example, I'm just going to be walking you through exactly how I would do this problem and modeling my thinking. So I'm looking at a right triangle thinking, right triangles have a hypotenuse. I label this first every single time. The next thing that I do is I see if anything else can be used before my trigonometry to figure out some missing pieces. The reason why I do that is because Pythagorean theorem and interior angle sum give out exactness and not approximations. Trigonometry oftentimes will give us approximations. I don't want to be using approximations to figure out other pieces of math. So I'm looking at this as a right triangle, yes, hypotenuse, yes, but I'm noticing I have two sides and I can find a third one. So I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem to find that side and not trigonometry. I don't even have an angle anyway, so I can't, but I don't want to use trigonometry to find an approximation to an angle, then use that approximated angle to find a missing side. That would be a no-no. That would take an error and compound it to more error. An error being slightly off from the exact. That's what we mean by that. So I'm looking at this going, Pythagorean theorem is, is a win for me. I'm going to do leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. We'll go ahead and I always fill my hypotenuse out first. So I have a pattern that works in my head. I know hypotenuse is always by itself being squared. So I locate it. I've already labeled it. Now six goes there. I'm just going to make sure my legs are on one side. It doesn't matter the order. It just matters that the legs are, are together on one side of the equation, hypotenuse on the other, and you follow the Pythagorean theorem. Then we're going to simplify. I know b squared plus 16 would equal 36 b squared now would equal 20 if we subtract 16. If we take a square root, b now equals, let's see, 20 is 4 times 5. The square root of 4 would be 2. 
The square root of five is not simplifiable in a square root. So this side is exactly two square root five. You could certainly find an approximation. Just take two times square root of five and you'll have about how long that is. Here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. What you can do, you can use this in more math. Why? Because it's exact. This is not a rounded thing here. This is exactly what you, you, you have for that length what you can't do. You can't approximate this, which means giving you a decimal that your calculator gave you. You can't give me a decimal and then use that number because that's rounded. That's not quite exactly what it is. Now, do you really want to use that side? Well, I'll tell you what, these two sides are a little bit nicer to use. So I'm probably not going to do that, but you could if you wanted to. So I've used Pythagorean theorem. I found out everything else that I could that's an additional side, but I still need to find two angles. So how do I do it? Identify the angle that you want to find. Now, that could be either A or B. I'm going to find angle A because it looks a little bit nicer for me to label opposite and adjacent. It doesn't really matter. The reason why we mark it is so that we don't accidentally get confused what angle we're working with. So I mark angle A. I've already labeled hypotenuse, but after you've marked your angle, you can now label the opposite side and the adjacent side. So it goes in a very specific order. Hypotenuse, Find out the stuff you can without trig, label an angle you have, or one you want to find. I've done that. From that angle, label the opposite side. That's right across, draw a straight line or imagine a straight line from that angle right through your triangle. It will hit your opposite side. The last side has to be adjacent. What adjacent means is next to. So uh, the adjacent side would be the side that's next to your angle but not the hypotenuse. You've already labeled hypotenuse, so that's not even a big deal. It's got to be this side. Now we're free to go. We know all three sides. You could, you could use tangent as 4 over 2 square root 5. I wouldn't. You could use uh, sine as 4 over 6. You could use cosine as 2 square root 5 over 6. Which one would be easiest? I like the one that doesn't have the square root. So when I'm looking at this, I see angle that I have, I see an opposite side, I see a hypotenuse side. I probably don't want to use adjacent. So if I don't want to use the adjacent, maybe I rounded and I can't use it, you shouldn't, but uh, maybe because it has a square root I don't want to. If I don't want to use adjacent, I don't want to use tangent or cosine. I just want to use sine. So I'm going to relate sine of A that's the angle I've marked, that's the sides that I, I reference according to angle. Uh, sine of angle A equals 4 over 6. Notice this technique of eliminating what you, you really don't want to use or eliminating what you don't have can be very helpful. A lot of students really like that. Uh, it works especially if you only know two sides, or sorry, if you only know one side and an angle and you're trying to find a specific missing side. That works very, very well. So now that I have sine of A equals 4 over 6, I've got to solve for A. So I need to undo sine. Undo sine. Sine inverse undoes sine. So I'm going to do sine inverse of both sides. Sine inverse is going to undo the sine and leave us with A. Sine inverse of 4 sixths is an exact answer. That, that, is, that is an angle. So if sine of angle gives you sides, sine inverse of sides gives you back an angle. This is the exact angle. Also, you do not need to simplify that. At least, well, I wouldn't because your calculator is going to do it for you. You can. It's not a problem. Um, for an exact answer, if you need to leave it, yeah, you probably use sine inverse of, of two-thirds. But when you're using this for an approximation purpose, plug it in just like that. So we get that angle A is about 41.8 degrees. Now, how in the world do you find angle B? If you're only concerned about the approximation, just subtract 90 minus that angle absolutely fine. So 90 minus 41.8 is 48.2. If you needed the exact angle, you'd have to do more trigonometry. So we would re-identify what angle we're looking for.
like angle B, we relabel our sides like this is the opposite and this is the adjacent. Your hypotenuse does not change. And I'd think about what I want to use in order to find angle B. So I probably don't want to use a square root. So I cross out, let's see, that would be the opposite side. I wouldn't want to use tangent and I want want to use sine because those include the opposite side. I'd use cosine. Cosine of angle B would be adjacent over hypotenuse, four over six. If we do all the work, if we take it cosine inverse of both sides, if we use that as an approximation, then we're going to get exactly the same thing we got from subtraction if we round to the same decimal place. So this is about 48.2 degrees, but that is the exact. That's exactly what that angle would be. The last thing we want to do is, is check, make sure that this makes sense. Um, has the Pythagorean theorem held to that's the longest side? Yeah, it really has. That's less than six. Has it held to larger angles open to larger sides. This opens to four. Uh, this larger angle opens something slightly more than four. This is a little over two. So something a little over two times two is something a little over four. Uh, so I hope that's made sense to you. I hope that this, uh, this process is really starting to click. Um, it really does help to label the sides the way I've shown you in order to pick out the right trig function. So I'm gonna come back with one more and then we're gonna be done. Okay, last example. Let's suppose you wanted to find the height of something really tall, but you couldn't actually measure it, like maybe a volcano. You can't measure the top of a volcano, but you wouldn't want to climb to the top of a volcano. So is there a way to do it? Well, with some instrumentation, you certainly can. So let's imagine that you look on, I don't know, Google Maps or something, and you found that a distance from the center of this volcano to a place that you can reasonably stand is like 80 feet. And from that place, you're able to take an angular measurement with like a clinometer or a hypsometer or some sort of tool. And you figure that from that point to the top of that, that volcano is 85.4 degrees. Can we figure out the height? Well, the height would create this, this perpendicular, this, this right angle. So we have a right triangle. So what now, what in the world are we going to do? The first thing you do on any right triangle is label the hypotenuse. So if I see this right triangle, I'm going to label the hypotenuse. Next, let's see if we can find anything without trigonometry. So Pythagorean theorem, man, if I knew the hypotenuse, I could find the height. I wouldn't even need trig. Um, I could find that angle. It's not really relevant to this. This I'm not asked for, so I don't really need to find it. I'm just focused on the height here. So there's not really anything that's causing me to, to need anything but trig here. So how do I know I need trig? I'm given an angle and asked for a missing side. That's usually an indication you're using trigonometry. So I have seen right triangle, I've done hypotenuse, I've checked if I need anything else besides trigonometry and I don't. Let's go ahead and let's mark out the angle that I'm given or an angle that I want to use. Now I'm seeing that I've been given this angle of 85.4 degrees. I'm going to be using this angle. So I'm going to mark that. From that angle, let's label the opposite side and the adjacent side. The hypotenuse is done, so thinking straight through this triangle, I would come across this as my opposite side. The only other side left is the adjacent side. So I have right triangle, got this, got opposite, got adjacent. Now we're going to find the trig function that actually works. So let's see what we have. Let's see what we don't have and what we don't need to find. Opposite looks pretty important because I need to find it. Adjacent looks pretty important because I have it. Hypotenuse, hypotenuse is not given, nor is it even asked for. So I don't need to use it, and I certainly don't want to use anything that, that needs it. So if I don't need or don't want or don't have hypotenuse, it has nothing to do with the, the problem. That means that all the trig functions that involve the hypotenuse are off the table. The only one left is tangent. And thankfully, tangent of this angle is going to relate the, the opposite what I want to know with the adjacent, what I already know. Remember that with three things, an angle and two sides, you need to know two of them to find the missing one. So I need to know an angle and a side to find a missing side. And that's exactly what we have. Yeah. 
So tangent of 85.4 degrees equals h, that's the opposite, over 80. We're going to solve for h. When you have a fraction with a variable in an equation, most of the time we get rid of that fraction by multiplying by the denominator. So let's multiply both sides by 80. You know what? We're done. If you were looking for an exact height of this volcano or whatever it is, this is it. This contains all the information about how high this is from the base to the very top of that volcano. Now, most of the time we want to do an approximation just to get a better handle on what that means. So we'll plug this into the calculator. We get about 985.91 feet. Uh, so that's a pretty good approximation for how tall that that volcano is, provided that our information is accurate. Now, what might be a better approach? Is this number actually reasonable to find? Well, maybe if you have like a, a, a map of it from, from the top, you could do that, like a Google Earth thing, you look down and there's a center, there's the edge where I'm standing, that, that's fine. Um, a lot of times though, we don't, we don't have that. So what could you do if you did not have this number? Number one, tangent would not work because you'd need that adjacent. You need to know something else. What some people do is they take a, what's called a laser rangefinder and they say, hey, if this is a certain distance from here to here, then I could use, well, what? If this is a known number, like from a rangefinder or something, you could use, here's your angle, you'd still know that. Here's your height, you'd still want to find that. If you knew this number, it would be opposite over hypotenuse. You wouldn't be able to use adjacent. You wouldn't be able to use cosine or tangent. You'd have to use sine. Now, it's still very possible. You would just multiply sine of 85.4 degrees times whatever that number is that you would find. That's probably a little more realistic for like, a, I want to do this right now type of a thing rather than having to, uh, to look from like a, a bird's eye view or something. So I hope this lesson's made sense. I hope we give me a good technique on how you take trigonometry and apply it to right triangles to find missing sides, like we've done here, and missing angles like I showed you earlier. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we're going to move on to law of signs next time and deal with non-right triangles, which is kind of fun too. Have a great day.